Good morning, and welcome to Ellerslie Church Online. We're so glad that you're able to join us today. If you're joining us live, we'd love to interact with you in the chat and have a chance to connect with one another as we engage our service together. If you're joining us later on, thanks for taking time out of your day to be a part of our service. If we haven't met before, my name is David, and I work as part of the adult ministries team here at the church. I love to help people get connected here at Ellerslie and to find a place to belong within our church family. Let's join together in worship as our team leads us in a few songs. Feel free to stand and to sing along or to sit and reflect on the words that are being sung. Underdressed you justify me You tore down strong Justify me. The beggar's cup is filled with grace. Now I'm seated with the king. Your kindness leads me to repentance. You can. So death, you served my sentence. My inheritance is overflow, cause I'm seated with the King. Search me and prove me. I know your words are true. Consecrate me, make me one with you. Unqualified, you justify me. You tear down strongholds, justify me.
but it's my reality you are holy and I am
Let's pray together. God, we praise and honor you for your great mercy given to us. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus on the cross, and that through his death and resurrection, we have a living and breathing hope. Today, as we gather in our building and online scattered throughout the world, we ask that you encounter each of us powerfully through the praises that we sing, the words that we hear, and the connection and community that we experience. As we gather together, we turn over the ways in which we have not trusted you this week. We ask that you would reveal to us the idols and the priorities in our lives that do not align with you. And as we seek you, help us to be drawn deeper into relationship with you and alignment with your will. We ask that this week we'd be made more mindful of your presence. Help us to see and live in your strength so that we can overcome our sinful nature. God, we thank you for our message last week and for the call to be resident aliens, to be in this world, but not of this world. We thank you for the higher calling on our lives, and we ask that you would help us to see more ways that we can be drawn into your kingdom. We thank you for the many ways you are working in our community this week. Thank you for our provincial leaders, our federal leaders, and our healthcare workers. And we ask that you protect them and keep them safe and give them wisdom to lead. 
We thank you for our Ellerslie English Second Language Program. Thank you for the volunteers who give time each week to help others learn and develop their English speaking ability. We thank you for those who are joining our class each week from Edmonton, Vancouver, and Whitehorse, and from around the world in, Ven in China and Guatemala. We ask that you would help our teachers and the students to have great community and relationships, and that through the work in teaching that you would be magnified and made known to those gathered. And thank you for our time together and for the message that was prepared. And as we listen to Pastor Dave, we ask that his words would be empowered by the Holy Spirit as he shares a message today on how we can be more resilient as we recognize you as our source of hope. Amen. Before we dive into this week's message, there are a few things we think you need to know. If you're looking to connect with others in a deeper way, triads are a great place to start. Triads are groups of three to five people that meet on a regular basis to grow alongside one another. If you are interested in joining or starting a triad, we'll be having a triads and discipleship meeting Wednesday, April 28th at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. We would like to invite you to spend part of your evening with us as we give an introduction to triads, share some stories, and prov provide the tools we have available. To register, fill out a connect card at erbc.ca slash connect. One of the things I love about my job here at Ellerslie is having a front row seat to seeing kids encounter the grace, love, and truth of Jesus. We have created three different options for your kids to engage with Kids Church each week. If you're looking for a more interactive Kids Church online option, then sign your kids up for our Zoom Hangouts, which happen on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. If you're looking for a Kids Church online option your kids can do at any time, then check out our Kids Church On Demand videos, which are available on our ERBC Kids YouTube channel. We are also currently running Kids Church on site for a limited number. For more information on any of these options, please visit erbc.ca. Your faithful giving allows us to continue producing our online content for all ages and support both our local care team and our global mission partners all around the world. There are a variety of ways you can con continue to support Ellerslie. This is also your last week to get in your donations for our Easter project. For more information on how to give, head on over to erbc.ca slash give. Now grab your pen, a notebook, and a Bible as we dive into our second message on Resilient. I'd like to start this morning by telling you two stories of friends of mine. The first story is about one of my best friends. We've been close for 35 years. Our parents to this day still live two doors down from one another. And from the time we learned how to ride our bikes, we've been inseparable. We grew up playing sports and attending soccer camps together. We played video games together, went on summer trips together, were in one another's wedding parties. He was actually the man who set me up with my wife. I would do anything for him. As of today, he's not ready to commit to God or to the church, but he really enjoys talking about religion. He'll ask questions about what's going on in the church and what on earth do I do during the week. He'll hear something about uh, the Bible, religion, or God on the radio and give me a call and ask perspective. He's just not ready to commit. My buddy also throws incredible parties. Him and his wife are just excellent hosts and love to have people over to their home. Whenever I show up, his sister-in-law just peppers me with questions. Like my friend, she's totally open to God and the church just doesn't want to make a commitment and stays at arm's length. But I'm happy to engage her in discussion and hopefully draw both of them just a little bit closer to Jesus. At one of these parties, she was particularly intense. She had just had a conversation with another Christian friend and she needed answers. About 30 minutes or so after being grilled, my buddy says to her, just leave Dave alone. We're having a party and he wants to enjoy himself. I don't remember at all what we were talking about. But I remember her next line. Listen to this. The reason I like talking to Dave so much is because he isn't one of those weird born again Christians. My buddy started laughing and said almost exactly the same thing. It was the first time I was caught off guard all night. What did they mean, one of those weird born again Christians? Story number two. I may have shared this one before, but in a previous church environment, I made a friend through one of my soccer connections. He was going through a difficult time in his marriage, and he just wanted somebody to talk to. After learning I was a pastor, he too had a lot of questions. 
during that particular stage in my life, I was reading a lot of books on apologetics and learning how to better defend the Christian faith. So I felt like I had an answer for everything. We would go on walks and I would spout something off and th think to myself, nailed it. But my friend really didn't express any interest for God in the church. But then one day I was helping him move from his condo to his new townhouse. And at that time, he didn't have a question about God or the Bible or church. This time he had a question for me. We were in one of those super uncomfortable moving vans bouncing up and down across town. And he looked at me and he said, Dave, why are you a Christian? All my reading, all my study just seemed to vanish in that moment. Why do I believe the things I do? At the time, I remember thinking how inadequate my answer felt, but it was the only thing that came out of my lips. One single word. Hope. My friend started coming to church. He joined Alpha. He committed his life to Jesus. And then I had the privilege of baptizing him in a river about one year later. We mention the four eyes around here pretty regularly. We want to be people of influence and then invite, include, and invest. I hope you're praying for a group of friends or classmates, coworkers, maybe neighbors. If God presented you with an opportunity that you've been praying for and your friend said to you, so, why are you a Christian? What would you say to them? If you're watching online, type in your answers. We'd love to read them and interact with you. Last week, we started a brand new sermon series on the book of 1 Peter. And you have, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd invite you to open them up to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a book about staying committed to Jesus in the face of suffering. It's a book about perseverance, grit, resilience, and what God has in store for us. Most of us watching online are already followers of Jesus, and we're ready to listen. We have Bibles open in our laps, maybe a phone or notebook to jot down some notes. We're ready to go. But some of you aren't there quite yet. You want to check us out. And man, does watching online allow you to do that from the comfort of your home. I love what technology allows us to do. You have questions about God, the church, the Bible, and the preacher starts talking about this weird born-again stuff. What's that all about? Two thoughts for you this morning. One, we'd love to talk to you. Whether you fill out a connecting card or email one of our team members directly, we'd love to get to know you better. But the second thought, listen for the incredible news of hope that is offered to everybody through the person of Jesus. The author of this letter, Peter, isn't telling us to focus on our job, our family, or our circumstances, or anything else. He's reminding us to keep our focus on God and how that's the best news the world has ever heard. For the note takers in the room, here's how that hope begins. New life. This is verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. To answer the question left unspoken from the introduction, I most definitely am one of those born-again Christians, which left my friends rather shocked when I made that announcement. Am I weird? Probably depends on who you ask. The phrase born again only comes up four times in the scriptures, twice in John chapter 3 and twice here in 1 Peter 1. So let's check out the only other place we find it. This is John 3, verses 1 to 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, well, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We need to understand a little bit about Nicodemus to know how special this conversation is. Normally, when we hear about a Pharisee interacting with Jesus, we get ready for a fight. The Pharisees are Jewish lawyers. They're teachers of the law, rulers of the Jewish people. They're the power brokers among the Israelite community. And they don't really like Jesus. Nicodemus would have known the Jewish law inside and out. He almost certainly had the first five books of the Bible entirely memorized. He could discuss the nuance of each of the 613 laws and how it impacted Jewish life. 
He would have also been highly regarded for his moral excellence and looked upon as a pillar in Jewish community. On top of that, he was pretty rich. So think about this. Jewish ruler and lawyer, moral excellence, incredible wealth. And yet, unlike his peers who were looking to pick fights with Jesus, he humbles himself and he comes to learn from him. If someone as holy and upright and well-respected as Nicodemus needs to be born again, what does that say about the rest of us? Everybody must be born again. But that causes a bit of a problem. In verse 4, Nicodemus says to Jesus, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I love how my kid's Bible has Jesus answer this question. It's just incredibly clear. Jesus explained that Nicodemus had not been born into God's kingdom and said God's kingdom had to be born inside him. In other words, we can't have new life until we're born again. We can't have that living hope until we're born again. We can't get the beauty and the majesty and the glory of Jesus until we're born again. Why the two different stories at the beginning of the message? Because we are born again into a living hope. I love how one commentator describes this new birth. He calls it a conversion of the imagination. Isn't that language beautiful? Conversion of the imagination. Another New Testament author writes in Romans chapter 12, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We take on new dispositions and attitudes. We begin to learn about the kingdom of God. There's that personal reconstruction that takes place in a whole new web of relationships. I feel like I've been playing soccer since I learned how to walk. The first Christmas present I ever remember was a soccer ball, and I'm not exaggerating to say I've spent thousands of hours on the soccer pitch. Soccer has been a huge part of my life, and as much as I enjoy the sport, there's also that huge uh, social aspect of hanging out with the guys before and after games and practices. But here's the thing I'm not thrilled about. The more time I spend with them, the more time I act and talk like them. I puff out my chest a little bit more, my joking might become a little bit more crass. I don't really like who I become. Here's what I've learned. If I immerse myself in that world, I start to act like that world. But if I see myself as visiting the dressing room, hanging out, spending some time, having some laughs and moving on, then my impact is much more meaningful. To give an illustration from the other side, Russ is our executive director of operations. He's a major part of our team, but a lot of his work is behind the scenes, so you don't actually see him too much. He walked into my office a couple weeks ago and was telling me about his triad. He meets with a group of three or four guys every Monday. And he says, Dave, you know what's amazing? It's kind of tongue in cheek. The more time I spend with my triad, the more time we talk about our struggles and challenges, the more we encourage one another and pray for one another, the better I feel. That's Christian community. That's the conversion of the imagination. That is what new life looks like. It's being born again into a living hope. And here's the best part. This new life comes with an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter's a really interesting book. He's writing to a mostly non-Jewish audience, yet he uses a lot of Old Testament imagery. The vast majority of the Old Testament is about the promised land, which is God's inheritance for his people. The first five books of the Bible, often referred to as the Torah or the law, is about the journey towards that promised land. The second major section, from Joshua to Nehemiah, is the history of Israel. How are they receiving and then losing the promised land? That inheritance that God gave them. The wisdom literature from Job to Song of Solomon, how to live in the promised land, the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi, are about the hopes and questions about this inheritance and what it looks like. Whether well-versed in Israelite history or simply thinking about the inheritance from our earthly parents, Peter reminds them, he reminds us, something much greater is coming. You want to talk about land? I will give you an elaborate home to call your own for all of eternity. 
Are you concerned about wealth? The very streets in heaven will be paved with gold and you will lack for nothing. Are you concerned your bodies will wear down? Not at all. God will give us new bodies that are stronger and more durable than Olympic athletes and will never fade away. Has your imagination been captured? Because a new life awaits. Peter's audience would be encouraged by these words, but rather um, pressing concern still exists. If you missed last week, we learned that this is a letter read to people who are facing a little bit of persecution, and they're certainly suffering for their faith. They might be asking themselves the question, do we have the strength to remain faithful to Jesus? What if this persecution and this suffering becomes more intense? We read in verse 5, by God's power, you are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let me do something a little bit risky here and dip my foot into the pool of politics. We'll see if it's cool to the touch or if I get burned. Understanding that in the church we're going to have, be all over the political spectrum and answers may vary. What do you believe is the primary role of government? I'm not looking for a whole grocery list here. I'm looking for the primary role. It might be more similar than you think. Whether you're liberal or NDP or conservative or Green Party or something else entirely, would it be fair to say the primary role is to protect the citizens? Now, we might disagree as to the extent that protection looks like, but some foreign nation invaded or, uh, our country. Wouldn't we expect our military to come and defend us? If someone bombed Saskatoon, wouldn't we say, that's like bombing Switzerland. What did they ever do to you? And come to their defense? If our flawed earthly government will protect us, how much more will God himself protect us? No one can steal your treasure. No one can disqualify you from receiving it. This is the new life that you've been born into. This is the living hope that God wants us to have. And it's better than anything this world has to offer. New life also comes with new challenges. And Peter doesn't glaze over the difficulties, but rather tells us how to journey through them. Verses 6 to 9 are about being joyful in trials. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is the biggest challenge or struggle that you're facing right now? What's the biggest challenge or struggle that you're facing at this exact moment? You might want to write it down privately, maybe share it with your neighbor if you're watching on our online platform, maybe ask for prayer. In the midst of our trials, we look to Jesus Christ as our living hope. Maybe your biggest trial is in the workplace. You don't have a job, you really dislike your job, or you're absolutely overwhelmed in the job you do have. Did you know that there will be work for us to do in heaven? That we will, be, we will find ourselves enjoying and feeling fulfilled in that work? Did you know that God wants us to start living in that new reality while we're here on earth? That we look at our work as bringing God's work into order, bringing God's beauty to this earth, his love into this workplace. I realize it doesn't mean that tomorrow you're going to wake up and there'll be an email job offer in your inbox. I get that. But with a living hope, it means that we can experience pain and rejoice at the very same time knowing a better day is coming. Maybe mental health challenges seem overwhelming. It feels like one of those old allergy commercials where everything is muted, the colors aren't as bright, the songs aren't as lively, everything is a little bit dull. God promises a peace that transcends understanding. I sincerely hope you get to experience that peace this side of heaven, but even on those really difficult days, circumstances will continue to change and always be in flux, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. With your eyes focused on him, there will always be hope for tomorrow. 
Maybe your relationships have gone a little sideways and things with family or classmates or coworkers just aren't in a good spot. God promises a time where every tear will be wiped away. And he's inviting you to join him in a mission of being peacemakers here on earth. Money troubles are real. Maybe you get a little discount with a nice smile or a funny joke. It's not going to pay rent or cover the cost of groceries. But a heavenly inheritance is coming in which your eternal wealth will never be in question. Peter is a book calling us to resilience, but he never promises it to be easy. He never discounts the suffering we're going through. He never says the pain isn't real, but he's constantly pointing us to Jesus and reminds us that we can rejoice despite the pain because we know a better day is coming. If our hope is placed in our present circumstances, we'll either be happy or sad, depending on what's going on around us. But if our greatest hope is placed in Jesus, we will always have a hope to hold on to. Remember verse 6 that says these trials will be just for a little while. My friends, be resilient. We are born again into a living hope. This past week I was getting my, into the car with my 7-year-old, and as we pulled out of the garage, he decided to start our conversation by dropping a bomb. Dad, I don't think I want to be a Christian anymore. Seeing that the day before he told me he wanted to be a pastor, I was caught a little bit off guard. But I recovered quickly and I asked him in a follow-up question, what makes you want to stop being a Christian, little buddy? His answer is exactly what Peter's original audience is wrestling with and what many of us are struggling with as well. Daddy, it's just so hard. Being a Christian is a lot of work and I don't know if I can always be good. I was pretty impressed with my little guy. Those are some big thoughts to work through. To say, I believe in God when things are going well, that's easy. Do you still believe in God when you lose your job? When your health deteriorates? When your child dies? When you realize how easy it is to watch church in your pajamas during a pandemic? Or not watch church at all? Do you continue to believe in God when things get tough? Take another look at what Peter is saying in verse 7 the tested genuineness of your faith. Right now is exam time for a lot of our young adults. They've spent the last few months going to school and learning about science or education or engineering and so much more. How do their professors know they're ready? They hand them a test. The trials we face, both small and large, are tests for our faithfulness to God. When difficulties come, will we run towards God or will we run away from him? Remember what we saw earlier. If your greatest hope is in your surrounding circumstances, you will either be happy or sad, and your environment will dictate your mood. But if your greatest hope is based on Jesus, you will always have hope. When I was in college, I did a directed study on Christian meditation. I met one-on-one -on -one regularly with a professor and was given assignments to help grow in my relationship with God. <clears throat> Most people are more familiar with Eastern meditation when the emphasis is on emptying your mind and looking for a state of nirvana. But Christian meditation is different. Christian med meditation is all about filling your mind with God. I recently went back to that journal I wrote during that time and read my entries. Nearly every page I mention, uh, I mention this incredible peace that I felt. That peace was despite the current circumstances, despite the fact our dorm flooded that semester and we had to find a new place to live, despite the fact the world was being turned upside down because where does a poor college student go, despite the fact I was totally inept with girls. The peace of God transcends understanding. Looking again at verses 8 and 9, there almost seems to be a sense of awe about Peter. Listen to it again. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples. 
he saw the glory of Jesus face to face. Peter lived with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, saw Jesus transform before his very eyes. In Matthew 17, we read, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, the sun and his clothes became white like light. But his audience had never seen Jesus. We've never seen Jesus. It's almost like there's this awe, this level of respect. And yet, you still love him. Friends, we are born again into a living hope. Part of the nature of our new birth is to think differently. Do you remember learning about the food chain in school? <clears throat> At the bottom of that pyramid is plant life, and th these are living things that can soak in sunlight, but they certainly can't protect themselves. When a rabbit or other herbivore comes along, it can eat it the grass and leaves to its heart content. But above that rabbit is a fox or other carnivores. It has to work a little harder for its food, but it doesn't have to be afraid when strolling around a farmland. We look at the food chain, it makes sense. But humanity is different. When we see a high school kid bullying a junior high kid, we know something is wrong. When another nation bombs Saskatoon, we rise to its defense. Most people will look at someone smaller than them and recognize you shouldn't hurt them. A child of God, someone who is born into new life, looks at the circumstances around them, looks at their sufferings, and can see that there is still joy to be had because they realize something that is beyond this life. In committing our lives to God, we're not restricted to what this world has to offer. We can look at our present situation, and even when it's difficult, know that something better is waiting for us. We can experience pain and be joyful because of the hope we have in Jesus. Let's take a step back for the larger picture. Peter frames this passage of Scripture to show us a living hope. We become followers of Jesus. We're given new life. New life will have suffering, but we can be joyful in that trial. Joyful in that suffering. We can be joyful because we know there's a future glory. And that's the third part of our outline today, verses 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, writes Peter, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be, was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were seeing not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Earlier in the message, we looked at Nicodemus, a member of the Pharisees, and his search for truth even though he most likely had the law memorized and people regularly came to him for advice. He was constantly searching for a better understanding. In John chapter 5, speaking to a whole group of Pharisees, Jesus looks at all who are present and says to them in verse 39, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. In Luke 24, shortly after Jesus rose from the dead, he met some people traveling along the road who were deeply discouraged because they had heard Jesus had died and no one knew where his body had went. He says to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what, what had been said in Scripture concerning himself. Even though the Old Testament prophets did not see clearly when their prophecies would come to pass, they were able to talk about a time when the Messiah would arrive, suffer, and ultimately be glorified. These verses are going to come quick, but if you'd like to do some further study, you can find them on our website and under the sermon page. Isaiah writes that the virgin will, be, uh, will give birth and be called Emmanuel, which means God with him. Micah took Isaiah's prophecy a step further and told the world that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem and would become ruler over all of Israel. The author of Genesis said Jesus would come to destroy the devil's work, and John, one of Jesus' closest friends, confirms this to be true. How would he destroy the devil's work? By being the perfect sacrifice for our sins. 
Jesus took the death that we deserve so that we might receive the life only he deserves, writes Isaiah in chapter 53. But because Jesus didn't look like the Messiah, everyone was expecting. He wasn't a military commander or a political giant. He became a stumbling block for many. Isaiah said this would happen in chapter 8. And the good news continues that because of his deep love for us, he would set the captives free, Isaiah 61. He would bring an end to sin, Daniel chapter 9. And, we would be, and he would be seated on an everlasting throne, Daniel 7. Everyone who looks on Jesus will be saved, Numbers 21. And he will pour out his spirit, Isaiah 44, and will receive new life. Ezekiel 37. The same spirit who worked through the prophets, the same spirit who rose Jesus from the dead, is now alive in everybody who believes in him. This news is so remarkable, says Peter, so fascinating that angels themselves, eternal beings created by God, never tire of marveling about how great the salvation is that is offered to all people. My friends, remember this. New life never comes without suffering. I've had the incredible privilege of being at the birth of all three of my kids. To watch those three children come into this world are three of the best days of my life. I even got to catch my second baby, but that's a story for another time. That incredible moment was preceded by incredible pain. And the only way a child can enter the world is through pain and the suffering of its mother. In a culture that is committed to improving our comfort and convenience, there's no easy way around this one. You can't call Uber and have them drop off a baby at your house. In social media, we'll have to wait until the afterbirth for the pictures. This is good old-fashioned hard work. But the afterproduct? Stunningly beautiful. One commentator writes, Our suffering is not a sign that Christ has betrayed us or that he is no longer Lord. Rather, it is a sign of our fellowship with the risen Lord who suffered for us. We enter into new life and future glory through the suffering of Jesus. The Son of God endured the pain of torture so we might receive the glory of heaven. Jesus was mocked and ridiculed so we might be called sons and daughters. Jesus was punched, whipped, and ultimately crucified so our wounds would be healed. Jesus died for our sins so we might be given new life and a future glory. One of the many things I appreciate about the Christian scriptures is how intellectually honest they are. They don't say becoming a Christian will make all of your problems go away. They actually say life's probably going to get more difficult. They don't downplay our sufferings, our hardships, or our trials. They acknowledge the very real struggles and circumstances that might be presenting themselves. And yet, in the middle of whatever is taking place, they continue to remind us that we are born into a living hope to keep our eyes focused on not, not on what is happening around us, but on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of 1 Peter. We thank you for this reminder of being resilient. And God, we ask that you would forgive us for when we run away when things get tough. And God, we ask that you would fill us so much with your spirit that when the difficulties hit, when situations are less than ideal, that we would find ourselves running towards you, our living hope. Thanks again for joining us. It was great to worship together and to dive into the message. If you enjoyed our service, feel free to give this video a like, to share it with your friends, and to subscribe to stay tuned with all of our videos here on YouTube.
Make sure you comment down below what your biggest takeaway from the service was. As we wrap up, some slides are going to roll with some upcoming events and connecting opportunities. As those scroll, feel free to hang out in the chat and to share your thoughts on the message. We hope to see you next week. Have a good one.